<laughs> Can everyone hear me? Awesome. Excellent. We were having a little few issues with my computer and its interest in using my headset, so we're going to hopefully uh, use just the computer and hope the room stays quiet. And you can't hear that ticking clock that's going to make me look at it too often. Esmeralda, are we ready to start? Awesome. Well, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Peggy Doty. I work for the University of Illinois Extension. Uh, as you can see, environmental and energy stewardship. My background, my first degree is in wildlife management. I focused on fur bears and um, waterfowl. And my second, uh, my master's degree is in curriculum and instruction and in outdoor teacher ed. I try to combine that with extension by utilizing a partnership. I run a nature center and offer the an education department for our local forest preserve. So they have education and we get a building to use and it works out very well. Uh, I want to welcome you today to this wonderful opportunity. I'm so excited people have signed up. We have an age range of wonderful science interested folks and I want to thank the teachers for taking advantage of this and for using it with your students and finding a way to reach out and give them experiences um, that are cost effective uh, and to hear different speakers and different people. I am really a local um, wildlife management naturalist type and I know you've had opportunities um, some of you have reached out and done some of the bigger scientists, uh, the you know, nationally. Well, today I'm going to offer you a program, and I, I offered it last year, and it's really um, based on the fact that we're running into in Illinois, and this would go with any any place. This is going to happen, not with these particular animals, but it's that interface. We're running in uh, due to human population. We're we're running face to face with some animals, and the hope today uh, is that you will. Start out number one, um, all of you listening will understand that biodiversity is critical. And the more pieces you have in place in that bio, that life diversity, the healthier your ecosystem is. And the opportunity for that ecosystem to give you ecological services, like our native pollinators, if things are all in place, they can do more for us as well. So it really does pay us back um, to care for these things and to understand them. The second point that I actually started with was that interface. Just due to human population all over the world, we are going to continue to have, I, I don't like the word confrontation, but the opportunity to resolve situations where animals are doing what they do, we're doing what we do, but they don't always match. And, and we tend to be afraid of things that are smarter than us or we feel are smarter than us. And we have to always remember that we cannot anthropomorphize a big word which basically means there's not a single animal out there going you know I don't like this person so I'm gonna tear up their yard you know they don't think like that every species whether it's plant or animal in our biodiverse world is simply trying to survive mature reproduce and then decompose and be part of that chain again they don't wake up with the same thoughts we are the we are the piece of this puzzle that has a brain that thinks and can process. So it really is a lot of our responsibility uh, to meet these interfaces with knowledge. So the hope is, um, you know, you don't have to love everything in nature. Um, I don't have a, an affection for some things, but I have a respect for them. But it's very critical, no matter if you're going to be a computer science, um, if you're going to be the garbage collector, um, a stay-at-home parent, if you're going to be a librarian, a lawyer, a doctor, it doesn't matter who you are, but as a community member, this natural world needs you to comprehend it because you're going to sit on committees and be a part of bigger things. And in order for you to make good decisions, it's important that, that we have everybody at the table, you know, grasping these things. It's not about just ecological capacity anymore. That word that means everything is, has a capacity to function, it also now has to do with how the ecological capacity and that social capacity go together. We have to ask people what they can live with and then address that when we're managing for wildlife in our space. So, long mini lecture at the beginning. We're going to go through some slides and I'll explain it. So, what I'm going to use is our Illinois as an example. 
because we are having an influx of three large predators that used to live here and they keep you know wandering in and people are a little moved uh, and some very frightened because these animals we don't have a fence we don't have a gate we're not in we're not putting them here they're simply coming in to check it out moving through realizing we don't have a lot of habitat for these particular animals that I'm going to introduce you to and then they move on but that time they're here becomes um, quite an array of different emotions for people some people are excited uh, some people are not excited at all you can imagine so the program agenda is going to be kind of focused on historical species in North, northern Illinois and again remember you're going to have species wherever you are they could be small but if they're making a difference in your life or in your community's life it matters right the the weasel that gets into the chicken coop in a farm in Nebraska has the same emotional effect on that farmer who raises chickens for eggs or money to support his family as it would in Texas in um, any other state so please remember this is kind of a case study of um, to use with different species where you are so historical description of what makes a predator large in this case or apex I've missed a space in that in that slide overview on human values human values are critical you cannot come together as a group and and not attend to all the different values people have um, so we'll talk really uh, a little bit about that and then the present and current of these three predators I'm talking about habitat behaviors adaptations um, and so where does that leave the matter of of predators here for us in Illinois well let's just say I get to program a lot more I get a lot more phone calls to come and speak when a cougar walks through right that gets pretty exciting but these are our historical species some of you have or have had these uh, we had the elk which actually kept our white deer in check and now we have plenty of white deer uh, the white-tailed deer rather um, they left the porcupine required a lot more coniferous forest we do not have, we never even had massive amounts of forest for them when uh, even just before you know when he, you know the European settlers came in in the mid 1800s and as as the state was succeeding the succession of the state you know a lot of times when I speak with third graders the first thing they say is oh we killed them all well number one you didn't kill anybody you're in third grade you know none of these animals you harmed but there were pressures with humans but we were already succeeding out of our forests and our prairies were kind of starting to consume more so not only the pressures of humans but also just natural natural succession and moving out of course if the lunchbox left you know the elk the wolves are going yeah for the amount of energy we put out to catch food the white-tailed deer are few and too small so they followed the elk the cougars and the bears were pressured bears were hunted for their pelt uh, for food and those pressures drove them them out as well as as we started to take a little bit of those trees away to make our homes which is not wrong we were breaking up those contiguous forests those forest chains and the bears don't like to be outside of the forest they like to be tucked in so apex predators that are and they're not necessarily carnivores right away we're like top of the food chain eats everybody else that gets us somehow strangely excited but grizzly bears are omnivorous black bears are omnivorous humans dominate the food chain um, but not if you're in an area where the predators are larger and able to harm you all right minus hunters people who uh, hunt game or hunt for food um, when we have that situation if you're out with uh, with a weapon to hunt then you might be the top of the food chain but personally I like living in a place where I am the top of the food chain uh, but many people you know if you're in Wisconsin you live every day with black bears they're like oversized raccoons right they're they have to pick through stuff uh, so we have to think about where we are in this mix so trophic levels many of you have heard this it's been excellent that it, it's been put out there and it's a great way to explain that we need our biodiversity in our state of Illinois we've been missing the very top of our food pyramid the, these large predators for since the mid 1800s so our food chain our, our web is off we have an enormous amount of white-tailed deer because our our biggest predator is a coyote and his largest prey is usually a rabbit okay so we don't have a complete food chain so when you're missing a piece and in this case we are missing those apex predators we're never going to get them back statewide we don't have the habitat for those animals anymore in Illinois we only have about 14 percent 
um, of our state that could sustain a small wolf pack. But they keep coming in and looking around, but they're not trying to take anything back. Animal adaptation, for the most part, takes a very long time. It isn't something that will happen overnight. There's not going to be all of a sudden every area covered in one of these large predators, but people don't know that. So they're considered crucial in maintaining those ecosystems. Now, when I was in college, I don't know who's listening, but some of you will remember things like the 80s. Oh, my goodness. Um, we were asked in our senior class, in our mammalogy class, to try to figure out what would fix Yellowstone's biodiversity issues and what would help Yellowstone get back to its overall health. And my group came up with, you know, the fact that the grizzly bears were dying and they were the apex predator because there were no wolves before 95 back in Yellowstone yet. And we came up with, well, the grizzly bears aren't getting enough food. They're going into hibernation thin. They're having lightweight babies. They're not producing enough milk to serve those babies. And they're dying. So the, the reproduction, you know, mode is off. Well, it's off because they aren't getting enough food. And what was missing were, were wolves because the wolves are a dual apex predator. So the grizzly bears could get some of their own food, but they really liked picking up the scraps from the wolves. So without those extra food items, they were actually compromised, thin, and underweight, and not healthy. So if you miss a breeding cycle of cubs, you're, you're decreasing your population. They're not going to breed again until the next year. So a TED Talk came out, and then a, this wonderful video, and I'm going to play it. Some of you have seen it, but seeing it again doesn't hurt. You'll see different things every time. It's only about four minutes. gives you a break from listening to me. And it's a wonderful video that I want you just most importantly to see and understand these trophic levels, this cascade of biodiversity. The, the neat thing is um, George, the gentleman who's the narrator, and did the TED Talk, he, he's got a really British accent. There are elk. They are a form of deer. He calls them deer, and if you're where I live, you're like, the only deer we know is white-tailed deer, uh, but he does call those deer. So I want, um, if this works, we will see. Worked last year. So I'm going to play this video for you, and then I'll come back and we'll, um, if you ever want to see it again, uh, teachers, all you have to do is put in how wolves change rivers. And um, it's just to show you that what we thought would fix the grizzly bears, we had no clue what could actually happen if you put together um, the biodiversity of a food chain again. Exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. And the classic example is what happened in the Yellowstone National Park in the United States when wolves were reintroduced in 1995. Now, we, we all know that wolves kill various species of animals, but perhaps we're slightly less aware that they give life to many others. Before the wolves turned up, they'd been absent for 70 years. But the numbers of deer, because there was nothing to hunt them, had built up and built up in the Yellowstone Park. And despite efforts by humans to control them, they'd managed to reduce much of the vegetation there to almost nothing. They'd just grazed it away. But as soon as the wolves arrived, even though they were few in number, they started to have the most remarkable effects. First, of course, they killed some of the deer, but that wasn't the major thing. Much more significantly, they radically changed the behavior of the deer. The deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily, particularly the valleys and the gorges. And immediately, those places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. Bare valley sides quickly became forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. And as soon as that happened, the birds started moving in. The number of songbirds and migratory birds started to increase greatly. 
the number of beavers started to increase because beavers like to, to eat the trees. And beavers, like wolves, are ecosystem engineers. They create niches for other species. And the dams they built in the rivers um, provided habitats for otters and muskrats and ducks and fish and reptiles and amphibians. The wolves killed coyotes. And as a result of that, the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, which meant more hawks, more weasels, more foxes, more badgers. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carrion that the wolves had left. Bears fed on it too, and their population began to rise as well, partly also because there were more berries growing on the regenerating shrubs. And the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the calves of the deer. Here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. They began to meander less. There was less erosion. The channels narrowed. More pools formed. More riffle sections, all of which were great for wildlife habitats. The rivers changed in response to the wolves. And the reason was that the regenerating forests stabilized the banks so that they collapsed less often, so that the rivers became more fixed in their course. Similarly, by driving the deer out of some places and the vegetation recovering on the valley sides, there was a soil erosion because the vegetation stabilized that as well. So the wolves, small in number, transformed not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, but also its physical geography. continue with our with our um, folks here that was in slides for the video so producers and consumers we're missing that very top piece so in Illinois we're missing this very tip and it makes a huge difference because our carnivore level for us really the coyote isn't working so much oh Let me know if that doesn't work for you. Let me try it. Here we go. Okay, now it kept clicking off. Man. Okay, now it kept clicking off when I was trying to raise the volume. Hopefully you can hear me now. Okay, so, okay, great. Thank you for letting me know, Kathleen. So I was pointing at this top piece in Illinois and possibly in the, um, you're welcome, in the state you're in, there may be a situation, it may not be large carnivores, it may be a middle piece to this food chain that's wavering. You may have a producer issue, a plant issue. All of our non-native species of plants, whole nother conversation, are down here and they're intruding in our native species and you can't tell me that that's not going to compromise this level as we worry about our native pollinators. Maybe you take out a chunk of this bottom support because there's no native pollinators or those native pollinators are missing and those plants die. Now you have to support this herbivore level, <clears throat> excuse me, 
with less native plants because we, we lost insects. This whole thing is very complex for a very simple picture. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's get back focused. I think you got it. So for us, this is my, you know, my little case study here. We have wolves stepping in, black bear, and let me tell you, when the cougars come through, things get really exciting. Uh, we definitely had a situation that um, in a town that had a woman home alone with her children. This is how most of our excitement started uh, in Morrison, Illinois, and she watched a cougar walk into her barn, and she was home alone with her kids that day, and nobody even thought about a cougar being in this part of Illinois and that kind of started this understanding that we may not be paying attention and maybe that wasn't the first one um, so that's when we have to talk about values she was alone she was nervous we have not had large predators like that since the 1800s and one walks into her barn um, her value is fear because our primary our primary fear is our safety our physical safety no matter who you are you you have that tendency um, and interest in some case, like myself, um, I want to preserve charismatic wildlife, but I also want to see it managed properly. I don't want it to be saved to the point where it harms itself or others. And then um, we need to sustain these apex predators where they belong, just like in Yellowstone. It creates a complete ecosystem health that we can't do as humans. You can't replicate that synthetically. A word here which I would use is pretend and make stuff up and build things. It has to be real to make it work the way it does or did. And it may never be exactly as it was, but we can caretake it um, and make things better and not utilize them and, and use them up. So I have a slide, and for people who, uh, you don't have to read all these, these, but I just look at the titles of them. So uh, Keller and Smith in 1996, um, a couple of environmental uh, type scientists, if you will, um, professors, they came up with these nine values. So you don't have to read all these verbatim. I'm not going to read them all verbatim. But basically, you can be more than one utilitarian, and you're going to you're going to utilize wildlife. Uh, maybe you hunt to feed your family. Um, if you're a naturalist, you you have a direct exposure, um, and you and work with them. If you work at a zoo, a park, if your relationship with them is visual, a birder, you you have this appreciation aesthetic because they're beautiful, symbolic, many of the three we're talking about in Illinois are very symbolic, humanistic, a strong emotional attachment, which can also harm animals like this because if you preserve them without management, and I'll talk about that with the cougars, you can actually cause more of a detriment, you know, more of a harm to them. So we have to be careful with how much we um, have humanistically involved. And it's okay, I'm humanistic when it comes to these. Moralistic, um, that spiritual reference, the Native Americans. Well, many people um, remember, st we study our, our Native Americans who still today have, have a, ref a reverence for these animals and they mean something to them spiritually. Um, and that's important. Doministic, you want to master them, you want to control them maybe. And negativistic, negative doesn't mean it's wrong or bad. Maybe it means, when we were talking about chickens, maybe negativistic is a fear or aversion for those weasels we talked about because they're annihilating the chicken coop. And that's money that feeds your family when you sell eggs or chickens. Negativistic in this case doesn't mean wrong. But if you sit at a table and there are nine people and everybody has a different value and you still have to have a conversation, you need to respect them. Everyone's values come from something from their past, from their culture, from their family. It's not something that they made a, a decision to have. It's what they know. Will they change that with conversation? They might, but they don't have to. And none of us have the right to force them to change that. And that's what makes talking about this at a table where you're having an influx of these predators much more valuable. So let's run through these critters really quick. Um, the gray wolf, uh, Canis lupus, otherwise known as the timber wolf. Uh, we we have had a number of wolves wandering into Illinois, and as I said before, in the case of Illinois, we only have about 14% of our state. Um, if you're listening from Illinois, that, that non-glaciated area, the Joe Davis, Galena zone on down the big Mississippi River way, um, a little bit maybe southern Illinois, but these wolves don't have enough room to have more than a small pack, um, and it hasn't happened yet. So the, the number of wolves in north of us is bringing them in to check it out. 
um, but they are wandering through right now and just kind of thinking about it. But that again, remember, adaptation for wildlife takes a long time. That's why animals become endangered so easily because once their numbers go down, if they can't adapt, the Kirkland's warbler almost died because it only liked young jack pine. And because we weren't getting new jack pines due to lack of fire and heat to open the pine cones, all the young jack pines became mature jack pines and the Kirkland's warbler didn't nest in mature jack pines. And to us, that's like, so just go nest in a big one. Okay, animals don't work that way. It takes time. And so these animals, if they do come into Illinois and stay, it's gonna take a little more time. And there's never been um, a recorded attack of a man by a wolf in Illinois, in, in actually in the US, except in Saskatchewan, they did find a man uh, and wolves tracks and he was he was gone however they don't know this situation um, but if you press one you know they're gonna protect themselves so it's not that you can just you know inadvertently go up to them but they aren't hunting you down that's that's absolutely not pop you know not what they're doing so this is just a list I want you to notice it started uh, the first one was was shot during a coyote hunt in 2002 and the wolves didn't just keep that date, like 1859, okay, we're all gone, we can't go back in. They were still trying to stay in and go out because there's there's history recordings of in barns and different things where they found them. But by 1859, um, a valid wolf pack, probably not in Illinois. We have, they get hit by cars. Um, they get, they've been shot. People have shot them on purpose and that is a fine um, uh, at this time. It is, you will get a fine for that. Um, and the interesting thing, I've had to add to this slide uh, over and over again, and I don't think, I don't know, the next one I think changes, but I, yeah, there's two slides. So check this out. I, when I first started doing this, it was um, right down near like 2008. And then when I started getting information, the 2009 was there. But look at this, males, 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 male, male, because the young males of all these animals are, are trying to find territory. A male and a female in Joe Davis, in that corner of, that I talked about, only about four miles apart. You have to believe they knew each other was there. And maybe they were thinking about it. Maybe they were together. Maybe they were um, a mated pair and they were, for some reason, apart at the time. Or, or one got harmed first and the other, you know, moved. But I find it interesting that it was strictly males. And then all of a sudden, I'll look at the next slide female, 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 right? So it's it's as if there's been a change and the females are now taking over, trying to figure out where territories could be. And maybe now we have an influx of this alpha female capability. The one at the bottom that says unconfirmed. Unconfirmed female was killed by a vehicle, you know, they get hit by cars. Um, and that was two years, two years ago, might be three now. But the problem is you can't say, oh, it's definitely a wolf because in the 1990s, one of the fad things to do was to own a wolf domestic dog hybrid where people were breeding captive wolves and dogs and selling them. So because you think it looks like a wolf until it's DNA tested and confirmed, it cannot be considered a wolf. And in that case, it took a while to get the DNA tests confirmed. It has a split in its DNA and it was it had a domestic dog, not, in, not its parents, but it did have domestic dog DNA, which immediately wipes it off as a confirmed wolf um, death. So my point, I guess, is you can't take a wolf track or a wolf by visual. You have to have DNA. The other two you don't, but this for the wolves you do. So the the furthest south, we we're talking about why you know why they're here. The the furthest south the wolf packs go, and this is hard to see. This is Monroe County, and this is the bottom line right now for wolf packs in Wisconsin. Doesn't mean they're not, you know, moving around a little bit. But where I live right now is about eh, at the bottom of the slide. So you can see we're just one, two, three, four, five, I'm like six counties away. That's gonna happen that they're gonna walk in. But I live in a, in a county that's 88% agriculture, corn and soybeans. Little bit of river, tiny river, a little bit of river habitat, a riparian habitat but lots of open space. These animals do not care for open space. They will cut through it, but there's no place for them to take up raising a family. 
Let's see where we go next here. So this is very interesting because things have changed. This is our current uh, wolf habitat. And because they wander down this way, this is considered, um, this is the, this was the delisted area, okay? So you could hunt here. Recently that has changed and you cannot hunt again. There's a lot of political uproar about this on both sides. So you have wolves that were being hunted. And then here they were considered endangered as an endangered, or a threat, I'm sorry, a threatened species. Below that, because they no longer go at hardly at all down here, they're considered endangered because they used to range down there, right? So because they're not there at all, that's considered endangered. So basically, if you were on I-80 and you made the poor decision to shoot a wolf that you knew was a wolf, if you shot it on the right side or bottom side of I-80, you would have a bigger uh, suit, a bigger federal, federal issue on your hands than if you did it on this side. How strange is that, that there's an actual line of bad and really bad. Um, and then I'll show you that if I can. I forgot you guys can't see my mouse. I'm getting so excited. So this is was delisted where you could hunt wolves during seasons. This is threatened, the light blue. And this was endangered, is endangered. Now in Illinois, you cannot hunt them at all. They absolutely can't. Nor can you hunt a cougar or a bear on purpose right now. We're trying to work out some social capacity of our populations in Illinois to figure out what to do. But... This is that if it was on the south side of I-80, it was a much bigger um, law break than being in harming one north of I-80, which I thought was very interesting. All right, so let's see what we have next. So here's where I live. I'm talking to you from, get my pointer back. I might as well just leave my pointer out, right? Right here, I'm, I'm right there in the middle of DeKalb County. And as you recall, it was only a few counties north of that state line where those wolves were. So we're getting wolves, and where the one that was hit by the car that was a mix was here in, in Grundy. Livingston, they've had wolf DNA tested, you know, yes, definitely wolf. So what they're doing is they're coming, and we're finding them mostly here, right? Where was the Pike? Here's Pike County. We had one there, right? So what's right there? That's the Illinois River Waterway. That is a riparian habitat thick with growth, terrain, wildlife, a, a bigger biodiversity of things to eat. Probably the deer gather there. So these wolves are coming down, and when they're checking things out, they hit that riparian area, and they're, oh, this is perfect. And they follow it, and they, and they have been known to, the radio-collared ones. Um, and then they follow back up the Illinois side till they find a bridge, cross the bridge into Iowa, then back up into Minnesota and Wisconsin. So they're kind of on a trek. So let's go to mountain lion. I'm watching my time. This is the one of the three. They're just unpredictable. Um, you're not being hunted by one. There's very few incidents, but we see them in the media, so we assume it's pretty common. It's not common. However, these would be the one. Think about your house cat. If anybody out there has a house cat, and they can, I have the sweetest house cat. I love her. I have dogs too. If you're if you're a dog person, don't be going. Oh, cats, right? She is the sweetest. Loves it when I'm gone. She misses me. She shows it. But there are times I'm walking down a dark hallway and she gets this mountain lion mental thing going, and she'll just uh, grab my leg. It's unpredictability of of that cat personality. Now imagine you have this animal. An adult can get up to 140 pounds, and it's unpredictable. And the ones that are wandering through are young males. So the mom, after she's got another set of babies coming. They're about 18 months old. She's like, get out. Uh, why? Because I'm having more kids and you need to go. Okay, I'll just go down in this area. No, who are you? I'm your dad. Oh, get out. Now I'm going to the next territory. You can't stay here. Why? I'm your uncle. I'm your cousin. I'm this. And they're moving, trying to find a territory of their own, and they fall into Illinois the tall grass prairie state. It's great when the grasses are up, they can hide, right? But they're not here seeking people. They're not here seeking, you know, to take over something. They're just trying to figure out what to do. And I'm going to show you what, why possibly some of that is happening in a moment. So notice the first one again, 2002. We must have just started paying attention to the wolves and the cougars, but I'm sure they were starting to meander in a little. We just weren't seeing them. And I do have some documentation that puts them back farther than 2002. 
just people going, hey, I saw a cougar, that's, you know, odd, but nobody was getting too excited, but we're starting to see them more. So the one that really got people going was this one in Chicago, in Roscoe Village. The problem with that is you have a community and you say, hey, there's a young cougar, which probably was not a large animal as far as cougars go, wandering around in Roscoe Village. And what did they do? They all came outside to look for it on their porches, front yards. This is a bad situation for everybody. And we have to protect our families and ourselves. And Illinois at this point was not set up with any form of tranquilizers because there was a lot of people said, and it did have to get destroyed. A lot of people were like, well, why did you have to kill it? Okay, we have no, at that time, we had no tranquilizer situations. We had no way to contain this animal or capture it. And if we did, if you put a large cat to, to sleep with a tranquilizer, you got to do something with it. You have to put it somewhere and you have to have a place to take it before it wakes up. And people don't think about that, that part of it. And also, personally, if you're a wild animal and you are t you know, trying to get through a place you accidentally got into that's terrifying, do you want to be put somewhere in a pen where you can paste for the rest of your life and never live your life for what it's supposed to be, which is grow up into maturity, raise your family, reproduce, live and reproduce more until you become part of the natural world and decay and become part of the circle of life. That's your whole world. And sticking them in a confined space and holding them there to protect them the rest of their life, I'm not so sure. Um, I'm not convinced that would be the right thing to do for him or her. In this case, they're all males because they're you know running out of space. Someone, Some of the research I found actually said that a male cougar's minimum home range that he would have to himself and kick others out was 70 square miles. Do you know how hard it's going to be for that to happen if they're reproducing up in the Dakotas and the management of cougars is not perfected yet. That's going to be hard for them to find enough space. So we've, we've had them clear down to Morgan County. Here's Pike and Calhoun again. And just recently, um, Brookfield, Wisconsin, outside of Milwaukee, one popped up. You can put that in on, it'll be on a YouTube video. Just put in cougar in Brookfield. And it jumps up because it sees a reflection in the window. And the guy happened to have a camera on the outside of his house, just a, you know, a camera to keep an eye on his house. So... They're just coming in and out, not huge. This is my favorite photo. This was in the Tribune. This poor gentleman, this officer, he's probably had about 80 of these clipped out of the paper, stuck to his desk the next day, and he probably got a lot of teasing. This cougar, look at him, tails down, head forward, ears forward. He's trying to get the heck out of Chicago and can't figure out how. He's probably had about 80 of these clipped out of the paper, stuck to his desk the next day, and he probably got a lot of teasing. This cougar, look at him, tails down, Head forward, ears forward. He's trying to get the heck out of Chicago and can't figure out how. This guy doesn't even know he's behind him. They're both terrified for their own self. It's not just a human matter in this case. So here, it's hard to see. The original home range is this pale cream. It's all this, not quite up into Canada. All this was their home range, everything. And now it's here. And all the cougars we're getting are from right there. Okay, they're, they're, some people are preserving them and keep, you know, wanting them to be safe and preserve them. But think about that square mile home range business. And you're like, well, how come they're coming clear over here? They're spreading out. And I think I have a map to show you. So look at this. So when we DNA test one that's been hit by a car, um, someone, um, you know, shot it, they are DNA testing to the Black Hills. Only this one down here came out of the lower, the lower states and it was hit by a train. But look at these guys. Everything that came in here up by us that I'm speaking from is from the Black Hills. And this one, there was one in Connecticut hit by a car way over here. He tested, DNA tested to the Black Hills. They're just trying to figure out where they belong in a place they don't have a place to go anymore. So that's a tricky situation. There's people in many of these places. And that's, that's what we're working with. All right, so I'm going to go back to a quick video, looking at my time. The reason I put this video in is because I think, again, we have to honor everybody's values. And there are wonderful groups that preserve cougars, that work for the preservation and protection of cougars. And I feel they did a very balanced job of, on this video. And I think it's, it's very short, but I think you will too. It doesn't mean that the value of someone 
harmed by a cougar or someone that lost their their person, one of their family members to a cougar, would have comfort in this. But this, I thought they did a very nice job and I'd like to play it for you. So I'm going to go over to the video player and I'm going to pick it. And this is called Small Odds. If you will raise your right hand and repeat after me. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. The office of the President of the United States. Hail, this is Houston, loud and clear. And now step off the land now. And now step off the land now. It's one small step to man. One small step to man. One giant leap to man. Giant leap to man. All right, we'll go back to this uh, slide set. So I thought it's a personal opinion, but I really thought they did a nice job. What they want to do is save all the cougars, but they they are trying to promote at least diminishing fear. First of all, we have to not fear them. Uh, I, again, uh, would say that we also need to consider management because you can harm a species um, not managing it just as much as you can um, letting it go and, and do what it needs to do. All right, so let's do black bear. Uh, here's our last little um, group, the Ursus Americanus. Just, they're wandering in. They used to be here, right? Lots of black bears. The interesting thing for me, um, 2009, <clears throat> the black bear was found hibernating in the middle of, well, a little bit north um, of where, um, oh, I'm trying to give you guys, I'll show you on a map, but it's basically not far from where I'm at now. And this male was half asleep, and I believe it was this one. They captured it. They took it to a place where it could live out its life. But somebody opened a can of pop when they were done working with the bear, and he was ma making his lips like he wanted some of it. He knew what soda was, and he opened chips, and he knew what snacks were. So they're pretty sure he was probably illegally owned by somebody and got away. Uh, the black bear seen in Joe Davis, again, that's that non-glaciated coming in and out of Wisconsin. They're very close to the Illinois line. I'll show you that map. And the interesting thing here, Bureau County is um, near, it's where Nepesa is. Okay, later, 2010, one year later, they have a mother and a cub spotted. Okay, so this is my take on this from what I understand from wildlife management. A female bear cub as she matures will not go more than 10 miles from her mother most of her life and now hundreds of miles from any female bear there shows this mother and cub my my personal theory is i bet the dad was the guy at first the 2009 bear that was captured and the mother and cub never spotted again probably got recaptured by the owner and you know and kept safe that way so I don't know that for a fact, but, it, but that's what I'm thinking of because of what we know about what bears do. So engineers tend to spot them. Uh, this one in 2014 was wandering around my area, which was more than exciting. Um, he managed to get back into Wisconsin, I'm sure, and somebody said, how are you so sure? Because back then it was legal. It wasn't illegal to shoot them in Illinois until t uh, January of 2015. So if somebody would have shot him, they could have said so, and they would have. Right? They would have said, I shot the bear, I, got, I took care of the problem, the fear, the safety, you know, that would have been done. But I think he made it back up into Wisconsin. So uh, the funny thing on that, the sheriff and I were talking, and he said, when I was getting ready to hang up, he said, wait, Peggy, I have a, I have a question, or I have something else. And he goes, I called Wisconsin. I said, yeah. He said, they don't want it back. And I said, they have many of them. I, think, I said, think large raccoon. 
And he said, oh, and then he got it. You know, they don't, they don't necessarily want them back. Look at this home range. This is where they used to be. So they're very comfortable, obviously, in many situations. And because we just don't have contiguous forests in our state, we don't see them. But Wisconsin has many because they do have a much better habitat for them. So here they are, and this map is the still the, the newest one I can find, and it's pretty it's getting pretty old. So here's here's the Illinois line. This is the occasional bears. Here's Joe Davis County in the corner. Here's me. So of course they're gonna be more continuously wandering through. It's just what's gonna happen as they populate as their numbers grow up. Little picture of a bear track just because I think they're absolutely adorable. What's interesting is skunk tracks are very similar. They're just a lot smaller, but either track, probably worth going in the house just to avoid anything, right? So I took this from the Chicago Tribune, and it is out of context, but the woman was scared for her pets and family. And I think it's interesting because think about what we've talked about. Think about food chains. Think about the non-anthropomorphizing. Don't make them into humans. They don't think like we do. And I believe animals have a right to live. I just think there's something that needs to be done so that they don't kill an animal. So she's afraid. Um, she doesn't understand maybe the food web, the food chain, the ecological systems, the services. This is why I'm saying you don't need to love everything in nature, but you need to understand it because you can't go to a community table as the local uh, restaurant owner or, or gas station owner or restaurant owner or the attorney, doctors, nurses, whoever you plan to be, you're going to be a part of a community. This is why I feel we need to all understand our natural area. We don't need to read all of this um, today, um, but Aldo Leopold was basically the founder of game management, that understanding that he finally realized at one point, you can't just keep shooting stuff or then it, there isn't any. We need to organize how we preserve and manage our animals. And that's based on... Um, knowing the food chain and seeing how it affects everything like we talked about. So I thought it was interesting. Think about what we talked about, that human capacity and wildlife. That's our situation. We are going to continue to grow our human population and the animals, if preserved and not managed, will grow their human, you know, or their population and they're going to interface. And that's what we have to work on is that social capacity. What are we comfortable with and what can we do to help them and keep ourselves in good order and safe as well as nature. So Leopold stated, it's right here, the hope of the future lies not in curbing the influence of human occupancy. What's that saying is we can't slow down humans. They're already doing that. This is 1933. And now, look, we're still worried about human population numbers. It's already too late, he said, for that. But in creating a better understanding of the extent of that influence, you know, how we influence, how people influence the rest of nature that we are a part of, you know, that we are, and a new ethic. For its governance so we're trying to come up with a new in illinois a new governance for these large animals as they come in and out you know what are we okay with what if a wolf a uh, small pack starts in joe davis my personal professional opinion is that'd be great because it would their their ecological food chain would be so much more complete than the rest of the state so this next wordy slide i did this to compare but Mark Miller used to be our Illinois Department of Natural Resources director, and he said when this was going on, you know, we've done such a great job of all these other animals listed, uh, sportsmen's, conservationists, landowners, environmentalists, professionals, they've all played, every community member has played a significant part in accomplishing these things. And then he wrote, now we must focus on the next step of creating a better understanding and a new ethics to support the future management, not preservation, and protection of large carnivores in Illinois. So what he's saying is we have to listen to what everyone is saying and weigh that against ecological capacities and what our, what our ecology needs. And I think that's a really wonderful statement because he says, I'm listening, but we also have to think of both sides. That's valuing everybody and valuing the um, having animals and their existence. So we have to be able to speak and share this with people. Hunting and trapping, just a little piece near the end here. Hunting and trapping, birds are the property of the federal government anywhere in the United States, minus the big three. We have pigeons, which are rock doves, European starlings, and house sparrows. All three brought over for different reasons. I always giggle because the house sparrow was brought over to be a pet. I can't imagine having that bird in my house in a cage as a pet. They're a big, fat little finch, right? 
but um, starlings were brought because we thought we could solve the cutworm problem. We didn't bring them to terrorize our other animals, but now they're invasive. And of course, pigeons, the groups that of those chubby little birds that fly around barns and areas, they're actually rock doves. Um, they are edible, they are edible. Um, so, but those aren't native. Every other bird is protected by the federal government, which means if you harm them, it's a federal offense. But all other wildlife, mussels, insects, birds, fish, herps, you know, the reptiles, amphibians, um, mammals, all these groups are in a state and every state has to organize them the way they see fit. Minus if there's an endangered or threatened species, then they have to work with the federal government on that. So the websites I posted um, for you and or teachers, if you have a question about wildlife or how to deal with it, or you just wanna see their personalities and, and how to best um, meet their needs, or depending on what you need, uh, the web extension Illinois EDU Wildlife and if you put in uh, University of Illinois Wildlife or Illinois Wildlife, you'll probably come up with our page. And also the DNR is a wonderful resource. Anybody's Department of Natural Resources would be a great starting point for your state if you had questions about animals. And of course, I'm always available um, at, at my email that was at the beginning, which is psdoty at illinois.edu. And let's go and see what else we have here. So this is my last slide. It's a painting I own that I love. And the reason I put it up there, it looked closely. This is probably more fun for a kid than it is for anybody else. I guess I'm a kid. So this is a wolf, a painting of a wolf footprint by Bev Doolittle. And it's called Walk Softly. And I think the point is we need to be careful. and We need to take our time and think clearly um, about our part of the biodiversity of this planet. We are nature. We are one of the species in it. And we have the most ability to, to manage, preserve, conserve, protect, anything you want to call it. Um, but look at this guy. There's his head. See the wolf in there? His ears, his eyes, nose, his back and tail, and his feet. So it's kind of that you know, when it leaves a print, it's leaving a portion of who it is and what it is behind. And I think that's really important for us to remember. So I would say in closing, um, keep values in mind. You, the one thing that I think, and for anybody younger than me out there, the one thing that is the most important thing that we somehow have forgotten, we were talking about this yesterday, um, it's okay for you to agree to disagree with someone. It's probably the best professional relationships relationships I have are the people that I can sit at a table with and agree to disagree on a topic and then talk about something totally you know, different. We don't have to go to a room and convince everyone to be on our side. And we also have to be willing to listen to those values. In this case, we can't solve these situations without it. We could be wrong. I could be wrong. I'm wrong probably every day. But I think honoring people's value and being in the room together to make decisions, and it really does go beyond wildlife, right, and biodiversity, but it's a good start. It's a good start and a good place to be. I have a chat room over here. I'm not the best at looking at it, but luckily there, I don't see any extended questions. I can take questions if you're still out there. Um, if you've already left, <laughs> sorry. Um, that's just kind of the part where I talked and you listened, and hopefully you didn't get done before I did. Um, so I'm here for a little bit longer. I think they leave me on till noon and I can answer via chat. And again, let me, I'm going to type up my email. So if your class, um, needs more conversation from me, we'll figure out how to hook up. And if you need more on this or want more information or want a different program, I'm sure that you could reach me. So I'm going to put that in the chat and hopefully that went in. I'm really, there it is. So, um, what is the best? Oh, what is the best thing about my job, about your job? Uh, Melanie asked, this, I can't see you though, and it's making me nuts. I'm a very um, physical talker, you know, body language. I was trying to keep it contained today. Um, I get, when I was a kid, I wanted to work with a student of the month or something for picking up somebody's books. I looked, um, I'm quite, I was quite the tomboy. And I, in my student of the month in middle school, I said, I want to work with animals or in, a, or in an animal related field. And this is what I do. I did not want to talk to people, but all I do now is talk to people. And it became obvious that my um, my love and excitement for the way people in wildlife manage themselves, I can express that. 
and I probably would have been talking to myself a lot if I was alone, you know, monitoring wildlife. Um, I miss not working on research. I love data and um, just being out there. I'm, I'm kind of a, actually, I'm a kind of an introvert and I love being on my own, just data collecting, but I do get to share information, research-based. That's the purpose of me working, you know, with the University of Illinois. In an extension job, you take the research and you get to apply it and share it with people. And it's it's research. It's been checked. It's not random information. And I work in a nature center with a 58-pound tortoise walking around, so that's pretty cool, too. Hmm. Anybody else have any thoughts? And honestly, feel free if your class has more questions to email me, too. What is the best way to manage disagreements? You know, my first thing is to remember that um, when somebody's saying something I totally disagree with, one of my one of my comebacks um, is always, and we agree to disagree, right? <laughs> because they're like, oh yeah, that's right. You don't, you're not going to change your mind. But I honor their 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 feeling on the point. I think honoring um, honoring that, saying I realize that's how you feel. And I get it, but but I also have you know um, this choice in my in my decisions and such. Tell me more about why you you know ask them instead of just saying well I don't agree. Why do you feel that way? And don't say it where you're like well why do you feel that way? Say like explain to me explain to me why this is so important to you. And if you care and you listen and you reply like good listeners. Um, you're going to, you still don't have to agree, but you've given them a chance to express themselves. And then you could say, may I share with you why I feel this way? And if they say no, say, okay, well, thanks anyway. You know, you don't have to make it a headstrong war on any topic, even beyond wildlife management. Uh, can you recommend books on this topic? Oh my gosh, come to my house. Um, I have a library wall of things. This topic, uh, boy, I don't know if there is a book, you know, I don't know if there's a book that just strictly focuses on uh, people interfacing with wildlife. I'm sure there is. I usually get management books, wildlife management books. That's how I was figuring out there's not a lot of cougar management yet. It's still kind of a living document of books. Um, but I would say anything that you could get that was research-based and not creative nonfiction, we want to be careful with that. And if you know it's creative nonfiction because you need that to get through it, then just be aware that that's what it is. Um, so, yeah, I'm reading a book right now that's totally different, but it's engaging and you're going to laugh. I can't, I'm not, I can't hear you, so you can laugh. Um, it's called The Sound of a Wild Snail Eating. I am so nerding out to this book, The Sound of a Wild Snail Eating. And it's, it's, a, it's a nonfiction book written by the perspective of this woman who was um, very ill for a long time and someone brought her a plant and there was a snail in it, but her creative writing ability, but she digs into the science of these animals. And I plan to do a whole program just like this, not for biodiversity, probably you may not want it, but I definitely plan to uh, do a program on, on snails and slugs. Somebody said, um, what's your favorite animal? I like animals that are smart and I like all the animals that people don't like because I'm very selfish and they make them more mine. I absolutely adore pot opossums, Virginia opossums, and I absolutely adore coyotes because they're brilliant and they drive people crazy, but they're not working against people. They're just living. Um, do I agree with deer culling? It totally depends on the management situation and the deer's health and the, and what's going on in that situation. That's a big question, um, but usually it is, it's a lack of management outside of where the deer are, you know, that create a, a situation that people are even considering that. Um, cities and towns where there's a lot of people um, and you have, you know, the rut coming, that can be a real tricky situation. Um, getting them out of a situation that's urban is very tricky. Are there any documentaries? You know, that, that tidbit that I showed you, um, there are a lot of documentaries out there on different individual animals, like the wolves. There's a lot of documentaries on the wolves that I, I enjoy and give you a lot of background information. Um, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you for all your thank yous. Um, just start typing in stuff. But again, please make sure it's research-based if you're going to um, believe it and hold it as part of your way of managing your values. And I hope that makes sense. Again, feel free to email me or reach out if you need something else. Um, no matter where you are, I'd love to, I'd love to look into wherever you all are. I can't, I can't imagine where you all exist. So, but thank you for being willing to listen. I appreciate it.
And I think our time is up on the minute. Mm-hmm.